Welcome, and thank you for standing by. All participants will be in a listen-only mode until the question and answer portion of the presentation. During that time, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 and record your name or prompt. As a reminder, this call is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. Now, I would like to turn the call to your host, Abby Capianco. You may begin. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to this media briefing on FDA's approval of the first COVID-19 vaccine. The vaccine has been known as the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine and will now be marketed as Comirnaty. I'm Abby Capobianco with FDA's Office of Media Affairs. In a moment, I will turn it over to Acting FDA Commissioner Dr. Janet Woodcock for opening remarks. Following Dr. Woodcock, Dr. Peter Marks, Director of the FDA Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, will also provide brief remarks. After the remarks, we will then move to the question and answer portion of the call. Reporters on the phone will be in a listen-only mode until we open the call up for questions. As a reminder, this audio call is being recorded and live streamed on the FDA's YouTube channel. When asking a question, please state your name and affiliation. Also, please ensure questions pertain to today's announcement and limit yourself to one question so we can get to as many questions as possible. With that, I will now turn the call over to Acting FDA Commissioner, Dr. Woodcock. Thank you, Abby, and thanks all of you for joining. Today is really an important day as the FDA has approved the first COVID-19 vaccine. And as you heard, the vaccine has been known as the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine and will now be marketed as Comirnaty for the prevention of COVID-19 disease in individuals 16 years of age and older. This is a pivotal moment for our country in the fight against the pandemic. While this and other vaccines have met the FDA's rigorous scientific standards for emergency use authorization, as the first FDA-approved COVID-19 vaccine, the public can be confident that this vaccine meets the FDA's gold standards for safety, effectiveness, and manufacturing quality that we require for an approved product. As we continue to battle the COVID-19 pandemic, we're acutely aware that vaccines are one of our greatest weapons against the virus. And we know that vaccine approval holds the promise of altering the course of the pandemic in the United States and that for some, an FDA-approved COVID vaccine may instill in them the confidence to go and get vaccinated. Working around the clock, FDA staff were able to complete the evaluation of this biologics license application in just over three months. This is an unprecedented timeline given the volume of review and the meticulous manner in which it was done. But we want to underscore that our efforts to move as quickly as possible have in no way sacrificed scientific standards or the integrity of our process. Approving the vaccine as rapidly as possible while ensuring a rigorous and thorough review has been our top priority. Based on the results from the clinical trial, the vaccine was 91% effective in preventing COVID-19 disease. Now, Dr. Marks will share more information about the data the FDA evaluated to come to the approval decision. While today's approval includes people ages 16 and older, the vaccine continues to be available under emergency use authorization for individuals 12 through 15 years of age and to provide a third dose for certain immunocompromised individuals. Healthcare providers can continue to use the vaccine on their shelves that was provided under EUA while production of the approved vaccine is under product is underway. The FDA approved vaccine and the EUA authorized vaccine have the same formulation and can be used interchangeably to provide the COVID-19 vaccine series. In remaining true to our commitment to transparency, information about the data that FDA evaluated to come to this decision will be posted on our website. Today's approval means that the American public can have confidence the community is safe and effective and meets FDA's rigorous standards. Please get your COVID-19 vaccine if you have not and help your family and friends get theirs. Thank you, and now I'll turn to Dr. Marks 
to discuss more about the FDA's process for approving this vaccine. Thank you, Dr. Woodcock. It's a pleasure being here today with all of you. First, I want to reiterate that this milestone in the fight against COVID-19 uh, has been accomplished by a group of committed public health professionals who have been guided by science in everything that they do and who've worked tirelessly over the past months for everyone's benefit. The FDA's evaluation of this biologics license application was incredibly thorough, and the public can trust that the data evaluated by the FDA on the vaccine's safety, effectiveness, and quality meet the agency's rigorous, globally recognized standards. We reviewed hundreds of thousands of pages of data and information about the vaccine's safety, effectiveness, and manufacturing quality, and we concluded and conducted inspections of various facilities where the vaccine is manufactured. I'd like to share more about our evaluation of the clinical data for this vaccine, which as Dr. Woodcock noted, is also detailed in many documents that will be available on the FDA's website. First, emergency use authorization for this vaccine, which was issued last December for individuals 16 years of age and older, was based on safety and effectiveness data from a randomized controlled blinded ongoing clinical trial conducted in tens of thousands of individuals. To support the FDA's approval, uh, decision today, the FDA reviewed updated data from the clinical trial that supported the emergency use authorization and that included a longer duration of follow-up in a larger patient population. Specifically, the FDA's evaluation of the biologics license application, uh, the agency evaluated effectiveness data from approximately 20,000 vaccine recipients and 20,000 placebo recipients ages 16 and older who did not have evidence of COVID-19 infection within a week of receiving the second dose. As Dr. Woodcock noted, based on the results from the clinical trial, the vaccine was 91% effective in preventing COVID-19 disease. The vaccine is clearly effective in, presenting, in preventing hospitalization and death, but may not always prevent infection symptoms of transmission of virus uh, from person to person uh, either. Um, the vaccine uh, safety was evaluated in approximately 22,000 people who received uh, the vaccine and 22,000 people who received placebo 16 years of age and older. And more than half of the clinical trial participants have been followed for safety follow-up for at least four months after the second dose, and approximately 12,000 vaccine recipients have been followed for at least six months. The most common reported side effects by clinical trial participants who received Clomerinity were pain, redness and swelling at the injection site, fatigue, headache, muscle or joint pain, chills, and fever. Additionally, the FDA conducted a rigorous evaluation of the data pertaining to myocarditis and pericarditis events following administration of the vaccine authorized for emergency use, and it's determined that the data demonstrate increased risk, particularly within seven days following the second dose. The observed risk is higher among males under 40 years of age compared to females and older males. The observed risk is highest in males aged 12 through 17 years of age, and available data from short-term follow-up suggests that most individual symptoms have now resolved uh, after the occurrence of uh, myocarditis. A warning about these risks is also included in the community prescribing information, which is available on FDA.gov. The FDA, together with our federal partners, will continue to closely monitor the vaccine safety to ensure that any potential concerns uh, continue to be identified and evaluated in a timely manner. The FDA is requiring the company to conduct post-marketing studies to further assess the risks of myocarditis and pericarditis following vaccination with community, including an evaluation of long-term outcomes among individuals who develop myocarditis. In addition, the company is committed to conducting uh, additional post-marketing safety studies, including conducting a pregnancy registry to study and evaluate pregnancy and infant outcomes after vaccination during pregnancy. We continue to work tirelessly to protect public health and are strongly committed to upholding the trust um, that the public has placed in us. Today's action signifies a major achievement in the challenge to end the COVID-19 pandemic. We know that working together, we will succeed in this goal. I'd like to take this opportunity to comment on one of the biggest challenges that we still face in getting the public vaccinated, and that's the overwhelming amount of information that's been circulating about COVID-19 vaccines. 
We've heard false claims that COVID-19 vaccines cause infertility, contain microchips, and cause COVID-19. And worse, we've heard false claims that thousands of people have died from the vaccine. Let me be clear, these claims are simply not true. Getting a COVID-19 vaccine can save your life. As Dr. Woodcock said a few moments ago, we know that for some people, FDA approval of a COVID-19 vaccine may give them the confidence to get vaccinated. By following our rigorous processes to evaluate this application, we hope those who have waited until now to make the choice to protect themselves and all thereby also help protect their communities uh, by reducing the spread of COVID-19 will go and get vaccinated. I urge you and your loved ones to get vaccinated and help put an end to this pandemic. I'd like now to turn uh, the press conference back over to the moderator. Thank you, Dr. Woodcock and Dr. Marks. At this time, we will begin the question and answer portion of the press conference. As a reminder, this call is being recorded. When asking a question, please state your name and affiliation. Also, please ensure questions pertain to today's announcement and limit yourself to one question so we can get to as many questions as possible. Operator, we'll take the first question, please. Absolutely. Our first question comes from Sarah Carlin Smith with the pink sheet. Hi, thanks for double. taking my question. Um, Given this announcement, there's been a lot of speculation um, that there could be off-label use of the vaccine, particularly in children under 12 where there's no EUA yet. Does FDA have any concerns regarding this use, particularly given the um, myocarditis data in the older um, pediatric population and just the different doses being tested in younger children? Yes, this is Janet Woodcock. First of all, we want to reiterate, it is important that the unvaccinated get vaccinated where it is indicated, but we do not have data on uh, the proper dose, nor do we have full data on the safety in children younger than what is in the EUA. And so that would be a great concern that people would uh, vaccinate children because we don't have the proper dose and we don't have uh, the safety data, nor do we have uh, all the efficacy data as well. So uh, we believe that trials, we need to get the uh, information and data on uses in younger children. They are not just small adults. And uh, we've learned that time and time again. And so we really would have to have the data and the appropriate dose before are recommending that, that children uh, be vaccinated. And ordinarily, as you know, when a um, medical uh, product is approved, uh, physicians uh, often do use uh, off-label prescribing. However, this is a different situation. The vaccine is being distributed under a provider agreement by the U.S. government through the CDC. And there are many considerations uh, that would pertain to off-label prescribing for the recipient and so forth. And so I'd refer people to the CDC for more information on that. But we are not recommending that children um, uh, younger than uh, age 12 be, be vaccinated with this vaccine. It would not be appropriate. Operator, we'll take the next question, please. Our next question comes from Jeannie Bowman of the Bloomberg Law. Line is open. Hi, thank you so much for taking my question. I was just wondering, um, you know, not, what, well, the the efficacy data that you had presented was, um, you know, I think before the Delta variant. So I was wondering what you could talk about and what we know, you know, about the efficacy now with um, the variant that is dominating. <clears throat> I will refer that to Dr. Marks. Yeah, th thanks for that question. I, there's various real-world evidence that are emerging here um, that suggests that the vaccine um, is still effective against the Delta variant. Obviously, as, as you probably uh, are, are alluding to here, that uh, data coming out of Israel seems to suggest that with time, uh, immunity from uh, the vaccine does tend to wane. Uh, and so that's something we'll be following closely. 
and obviously will be uh, leading into uh, consideration of uh, the thoughts regarding boosters, et cetera, as we move into the fall. Operator, we'll take the next question, please. Next question comes from Catherine Foley of Politico. On is open. Hi, thank you for taking questions. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk about how Pfizer's vaccine approval will change, I guess, the future of boosters for uh, those who are not immunocompromised, and if uh, this approval will, if, if off-label prescribing of this vaccine or, or giving of boosters of, of this vaccine um, will change the way that, that boosters are, are given for the rest of the population. This is Jana Woodcock. Again, we would emphasize that the most important thing is that people who are currently unvaccinated get vaccinated, and we hope this approval will bolster confidence of those who have been wavering. However, the uh, giving an additional dose of the vaccine other than immunocompromised is something where FDA will need to review the data um, and is not part of this uh, approval. And um, we need to look at both safety and efficacy data or uh, immunogenicity data and, and make a decision about that. So this, we do not, um, encourage off-label use because, as I said, ordinarily a clinician can do this, but this is a circumstance where the vaccine is being distributed under a provider agreement with the CDC, and so providers agree to conform to certain conditions. And I refer uh, you to the CDC for more information on that. Operator, we'll take the next question, please. Our next question comes from Brenda Goodman of the of WebMD. Mine is open. Hi, thanks. I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about the magnitude of what it takes to for the FDA to review a, a BLA um, like this, and because a lot of people have been wondering, you know, what took you so long, and then um, with Moderna, I'm wondering if you can tell it, give us any updates on on where that application stands. I'll refer that to Dr. Marks. So let me, I, I'm not going to be able to comment more about uh, Moderna. You can contact the uh, company for their plans, but I really am grateful for your question about <laughs> what it takes to review a BLA because people have been wondering what took so long. Well, FDA, when they conduct a review of, uh, when we conduct a review of a biologic license application, uh, we are uh, uh, highly rigorous in what we do. And we don't just look at, at what the summaries of data are. We go down to the level of the individual patients. What took time is that we actually go and we monitor a, a percentage of the sites where the terminal clinical trials were conducted in order to make sure that the data that was collected was collected accuracy and matches what was submitted to the agency. We go and we inspect the facilities um, that are making the product and making sure that they meet our high quality standards. And, and doing those inspections in the middle of a pandemic um, were not trivial. Um, uh, and uh, that had to be done. And then we went through um, tens of thousands of patients of data to make sure we looked at adverse events, efficacy data, did our own analyses in addition to the company's analyses. And then we also did uh, benefit risk assessments based on uh, real world data that has emerged since the vaccine has now been used in hundreds of millions of people globally. And so that actually takes a lot of uh, work and it's actually 97 days uh, since uh, Pfizer completed the role of its uh, BLA and the clock started, um, uh, which means that we completed this in about 40% of the uh, normal clock time uh, for a, a, a submission of this magnitude. So uh, there was a lot of work done and people worked day and night. Um, and I'm very grateful to uh, Dr. Woodcock for all of the support with extra uh, help in getting this done, as well as to a, a really a tireless team in our center uh, that worked night and day to get this done. Thank you. Operator, we'll take the next question, please. Our next question comes from Andrew Dunn with Business Insider. Your line is open. Hi, yes, thanks. I was wondering, does the FDA plan to convene 
verb pack to discuss booster shots, specifically Pfizer's EUA application for a booster. Dr. Marks, you might want to comment on that. Yeah, that, that, thanks very much for that question. We, there, a decision will, is, it will make, be made for, about that in an appropriate time um, once we have these submissions in-house and, uh, uh, and, and we have uh, been able to review them. Operator, we have time for one more question. Our last question comes from Andrew Joseph with STAT. The line is open. Hi, um, thanks very much. So, uh, sort of following up on Sarah's question earlier, I was just hoping you could give us the sort of any latest timeline on getting vaccines authorized for people or for kids 12 and under, or under 12, I should say. And I guess if, if you can just tell us what information specifically you might still be waiting on, if any, from trials before FDA can make that decision. Thank you. Sure, Dr. Marks. Yeah, thanks very much. So there is a lot of interest, obviously, in uh, vaccines for younger children. Currently, there are still trials ongoing here, and so the agency has to wait for the company to submit the data from those trials um, uh, so that we have a good safety data set, because we certainly want to make sure uh, that we get it right in uh, the children ages 5 through 11, and then even in younger children after that. Um, uh, and so we will uh, obviously move swiftly uh, once those data are submitted, but first, uh, the trials have to be finished up uh, and the, uh, or at least the parts of the trials that are going to be submitted to us have to be finished up uh, and then the data needs to be submitted to us. Thank you. This, this concludes today's FDA press conference. A replay will be available on the FDA's YouTube page. If you have follow-up questions, please don't hesitate to contact the FDA press office. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you for your participation. This concludes today's conference. You may disconnect at this time. Thank you.